It's a, it's a tremendous pleasure to, uh, to be here this evening. I've been visiting Angola since 1981, um, but on the other hand, uh, some people have far more experience than, than I do in that place. And um, you're only going to get an hour and a half this evening, so you have to buy the book because that gives you the full, what is it, 80,000 words, do you reckon? What do you think? Problem. Something like that. But, um, but let's, just, let's just go through a bit of this, Robert. And, um, and as I say, if anyone you know, wants to interrupt, feel, please feel free. Um, so let's start with sort of growing up African-American in New Orleans or in Louisiana. Tell us a bit about that. You know, when you were born in 1942, right? Correct. So tell us a bit what it was like back then. <laughs> Yeah, well, yes, uh, as you say, Clive, uh, oh, hello, good evening, welcome, thank you for coming. I've got to say, um, by the way, he's doing very well in England. He's given up all those perfidious uh, Louisiana drinks. He was having a gin and tonic downstairs. <laughs> we're getting him, in, we're getting no, him into really. tea. You're doing very well with him. Anyway, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, I was introduced to that by uh, someone in the audience, Mr. G. Very good, all right. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Uh, but anyway, uh, to answer your question, get to your question. Growing up in New Orleans, probably, I imagine I could, it could have been anywhere. New Orleans, just circumstantial, you know. I would just happen to be in New Orleans. And, um, you know, this was 1942. That was post-World War II, baby. Old school, very old, you know. And at the time, the condition, the circumstances was, were totally, you know, the perception that is was... The perception today is that things has gotten better, which is another story. But at that time, there wasn't any perception, not, not in the quarter of the area in which I resided in, that things were getting any better, you know. It was supposed to have been the golden years, but like I point out, um, it was more like 10, you know, um, 10 for us, um, the alloy 10. It wasn't anything golden. So, um, you know, I... Uh, at the time, I must admit that I wasn't, um, I wasn't politically, uh, conscious politically aware of anything like that. Um, but you were, you were aware of who you were. And I've got to say, I, have, I lived 26 years in, in America, and so I've only just overcome, actually last month, I'm back to having lived longer in Britain than in America. And one thing about the British is they're, they're incapable of talking about or dealing with issues of race. They really are. I mean, it's a very bizarre country, this place. Um, so tell us a bit about, you know, as a young black kid in New Orleans, what were your relationships with, like with, uh, with some of the white people there? Just because, you know, I think you have to understand a lot about 1942 to yep. have any understanding. You have to let me get there. Cool. You have to let me get there. I was trying to get there. Well, sure. <laughs> okay, there you go. See, I said you could interrupt, and he's now telling me you I know, shouldn't you know, interrupt. Oh, I God. was... Well, anyway, I was, being, you know, born in that in that area. I was being, you know, non-political at the time, but, you know, and being inarticulate about things, not being able to define or decipher just exactly what was going on, but having the feeling that something was wrong. Uh, I had that. It wasn't until some years later that uh, uh, someone else articulated my feeling, and uh, of course, many had said it before. Uh, I finally heard it. Um, uh, I only heard it when the Black Panther Party said it. But of course, uh, people like Frederick Douglass had said it years and years before, even during Chattel and people long before then, you know, even in her own words, Harriet Tubman had said the same thing. So John the Truth, I mean, just going on down the line, people had, you know, said these things and, and, and implied that there was something drastically wrong. And the fact that, you know, slavery was something that was considered um, legal in, in, you know, in, in, in America. So that, you know, people, people's idea uh, about slavery was one, especially doing that, I, you know, it, was, it wasn't anything appalling. Um, it wasn't anything that, was, that people considered immoral or anything. Um, slavery... Um, Again, you know, I could see it was it was it was it was legal, and I was a remnant of of what was uh, officially legal slavery. But it was um, alleged that it was uh, reputed that it was eliminated or abolished uh, during Chattel. But I I take issues with that for for other reasons. 
Um, but I felt this discrimination at that time. I saw racism in, in the row. Um, what would you I, get called, though? I, mean, I remember cross-examining a guy called Sheriff Lloyd mm -hmm. Goon Jones, who was the, the guy who ordered the Mississippi Highway Patrol to open fire on the Jackson State students. And he had called, you know, said that he always called black people niggers. And when I was cross-examining him, he said, oh, I stopped doing that, but someone told me it was rude. So I said, well, what do you call black people now? And he said, I call them colored boys now. And I said, when are you going to stop doing that? And he says, when someone says it's rude. And I said, I'm telling you it's rude. And he says, boy, I don't appreciate your opinion. I mean, you know, <laughs> tell him a bit about your, your experience. You were going through that. Uh, how would you get, you know, treated as, a, let's say you're a 15, 16 year old. <clears throat> I was a generation that had begun to kind of, you know, being post-World War II and seeing some things, and even though I was, couldn't articulate a, a lot of things, I think I, ha I, was, um, I was a part of a generation that was on the fringe of people accepting the stuff that you were talking about. We found ways to, to show our dissent, you mm -hmm. know, not be in being cruel or being evil. But for instance, I'll give you an idea for instance, like at one time I, you know, I was around during the time when they had the sign on the bus for colored patrons on. Cool, by the way, the name you just used, I only, I only use in quotation, colored, Negro, and all the rest of the, the I, don't, I don't cater to those words. Matter of fact, I'm about to do up a, a paper, a thesis um, on, on the term, how it derived, where it comes from, what it means. It doesn't matter how derogatory it is, it doesn't make a difference, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, about that. But what we used to do is we used to take, to show you how segregation and racism imparted and impacted everybody. It just wasn't the people who were considered victim, but there was a psychological misshapement of um, a degradation that, that's done to other people as well. We used to get on a bus in our way of, because they had this sign for colored patrons only. Uh, what we used to do as kids, you know, 8, 9, 10, 11, was 16 now years old, I was on the way to penitentiary, but 8, 9, 10, 11, uh, we used to take this sign and put it all the way up to the front <laughs> for colored patrons only. <laughs> and whites would, I'm sorry, whites would get on the bus and they would not go beyond that sign. <laughs> they would have 100 seats in the back. <laughs> and they would not go. But by the same token, mm -hmm. if it was placed in the back, whites would not sit until Rosa Parks did her thing, you know. Uh, there was a few blacks that also sat at uh, Define. Uh, Rosa Parks wasn't the first, and she wasn't really the only one. She just got the recognition. But even before her, there were people defying that particular thing. But I'm saying this to you is that this is how people um, people uh, allow themselves to be put in a box, think in a box, and act out action in a box. And no way in the world I would, I would, it wouldn't matter. No way in the world I would get on a bus tied, and there's a sign that says for colored patrons only. And I'm allowed to sit in the seat, and I stand up in front. I'll crowd my way in the front and be stand up in the front, smelling like sardines, hot as sardines, crowded as sardines. That I would go in. I wouldn't do that. And I was saying this: that how this impact not just the people who were victim of these laws, but it also impacted the people who lived by these, you know, who who allowed themselves to live by these laws, allowed themselves to be controlled. And I always refer to that, and I call it box thinking. People allow themselves to think in a box, the same way it is with the 13th uh, Amendment allegedly abolish, abolishing slavery. We know a 13th Amendment did not abolish slavery. Um, the, it doesn't matter what the language say. It say, you know, you know, slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist on these shores. And it goes on to say, except a person is duly convicted of a crime. Well, how many people in, a, in the states are duly convicted of a crime? So my point is this, that legality and morality, especially in the courtroom arena, they don't meet. They are not friends. Again, it was legal to own slaves. And it wasn't until people took a moral and saw slavery as being repulsive that slavery began to change as we know it. So for some people to believe in that, and I say this especially to, to, to I'm sorry, but I see this to lawyers a, a, a lot, a people who are expiring to be lawyers, a young people who are expiring to be lawyers. Please be able to distinguish that which is legal and that which is moral. Because I'm telling you, you will not find 
morality, not in not not in that in that courthouse. You may find a judge use his discretion and sprinkle, you know, his 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 decision with a little morality, but for the most part, no. Troy Davis was killed because of legality, because of legal precepts. You know, this is legality is the God of not just America, but especially America. Legality is de has been deified and is seen as a gift in his Whole, something wholesome from God, but no, like I said, again, it was legal and honestly. Robert, what you're talking about now is the subject of my upcoming best thriller, uh, bestseller, so we'll, you know, you'll have to come back and we'll discuss okay. that then. We'll do that. Is, um, when you went to trial back in 1970, um, who was in the courtroom? I'm just curious about who the judge was, who the prosecutor or persecutor as we call them was, um, who the defense lawyer was. Um, how many of those people were white? When I went to, uh, to trial, when I elected to go to trial, they had offered me a 15-year sentence. I elected to go to trial. And um, when I did go to trial, there was one black person on the jury, 11 whites. Mm -hmm. I imagine the substitute. Uh, and this also, is in New Orleans, which is it was a in New Orleans. black um, yes, town. It mm -hmm. was in New Orleans at the time, and the overwhelming majority, of, at that time, in 1970, at least about 55, 60 percent of the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but what about the other people, like all the lawyers and the judge and everyone? Was there anyone who? George. Was uh, I was trying to think of his name when you mentioned it. I don't know if you remember Wimbley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember Wimbley. Wimbley. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think he was my judge. Right. Um, uh, he was teacher. And how does it feel to be in a courtroom? I mean, I was uh, trying a case in Mississippi one time, and I always dress very badly in a courtroom, partly because I want the jury to think that, that I'm the guy on trial. And indeed, this was Sam Johnson, Johnson versus Mississippi. It was day two before they worked out that I wasn't, because Sam was very smartly dressed. But he was the only black person in that courtroom. You know, all the lawyers were white, everyone else. How does it feel to be on, you know, in a judicial system like that? At that time, what do you mean? Any time. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. Well, I, I, I wouldn't want to try to feel it. At this point in time, I don't want to go back before the judicial system, but at the, t <laughs> but at the time, you know, I, I really felt alienated. I felt that I was an outcast, to tell mm -hmm. the truth. Uh, usually when, especially in places like when I was subsequently, you know, charged in uh, allegedly participating in a, the issue in Angola, I was brought before St. Francisville. And I would tell you, going to that courthouse was almost like I had, you know, known a lot about chattel and about slavery and the mannerism at that time. But going to court in San Francisville was almost like looking, um, looking in, and looking at a, a, a movie depicting time of um, ancient time of, who, of slavery. Who has ever had shackles on them? Anyone? Yeah, tell them a bit, you know, what I, you know, I think it's hard for people to see sometimes, and I've been in St. Francisville Courthouse with the Angola Five, where they were all being treated a bit like you were. Mm -hmm. Tell them what it's, a bit, what it's like when they put those shackles on you and all the rest of that. Well, it depends. Uh, at the time when I went to trial in St. Francisville, we were shackled, we were bound, we were handcuffed. We had shackles on our, our feet, we had handcuffs, we were handcuffed behind our backs. Uh, and we had duct tape uh, on, your on our mouth. To shut uh, you the up. jurors had decreed that, yeah, that we would be tried in that way before a jury. And mm -hmm. actually, we sat before the entire jury of um, in that in that uh, condition. Uh, it took maybe two days for them to select a jury, and we sat before the venire and the subsequent jurors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like I say, in that in that uh, condition. But just to, to back up the point, you ever seen a movie how to someone how to kill a mockingbird or something oh, yeah. along mm -hmm. that line? Well, that's almost the way it it, it felt. Uh, of, of, I felt when going into a courthouse at that time. Uh, um, Brock Peters, I think, played Brock somebody. He played this. He played this how to kill a mockingbird, and he was the only he was the only black person there, and he was the one on trial. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could just about imagine how how I felt. Yeah. Now, one or two people here have been to Angola, right? How many people have been to Angola, the, the prison? Okay, tell them, tell them a bit about Angola first, about where did Angola get its name from? Well, Angola, I mean, 
takes takes his name or gets his name from um, the country Angola. Uh, and the reason why that is, um, it is alleged that uh, the people who, who that is the slaves, who house uh, that area, they were, you know, formerly from the country Angola. So the name sort of and go, sort of the stuck. prison was a plantation. The, the prison was yeah, a, a slave yeah, plantation. Of mm -hmm. course it was. Uh, but of course now the, it is known as the Louisiana State Penitentiary and Angola is known as a town because, quote, free people, they have, you know, taken inhabit the land. They've changed the name. In other words, this is a process in which the kind of the tail wagged the dog now. Mm -hmm. In other words, it was, a, they don't even refer to it uh, uh, in writing that is. It still had the old name Angola, but he referred to Louisiana State Penitentiary, and there's a town Angola because there are 5,000 inmates, or more than 5,000 inmates, and it takes 5,000 inmates to make up, 5,000 people to make up a town, to give them a town status so they could get money from the federal government and so forth. So what they have done is they have changed the, whole, the entire prison to uh, that, that whole setting as being Angola, mm -hmm. and it's a town now, and there's a prison, you know, a Louisiana state prison in the town of Angola, but prior to that, the prison was known called Angola. And I say they did that for tactical reasons. Mm. Um, now, when, when I first went up there in 81, there were those toilets, you know, just as you come up to the front gate, over to the left, there were the toilets, and they mm. were still back then, I mean, there still are today, four doors as you go in, but back then it still said colored and white as you, as you went in. Well, you were there 11 years before um, in 70. What was it like? when you first went up to Angola? Well, by 19, uh, around 1970, I think these, that, that's when they started, around 70, 71, uh, maybe 69, they started um, putting, prior to that time, there were dormitories for white, dormitories for blacks, and they started putting, um, they started mixing the dormitories up around that time. Um, that was probably as a result of, if you remember, Edwin Edwards, sure. uh, he, uh, Gotti Land Hunts, who was a secretary of correction at that time, wanted to bring Angola up into what he called the 20th century, and in doing that, uh, integrate the dormitories and mm -hmm. so forth, and do a, do a few other things by way of integration. But integration was a long way, because even now there isn't a whole lot of integration in, in Angola. When you first got there, did they still have the, the inmate guards? When I got there, yeah, so in 1970, it wasn't phased out until around 1972, I think. Uh, and that was Tell as a result about of... That. Tell them what... what well, inmate guards? Yeah, yeah. Well, they were the backbones of security. Um, they, uh, for years, for decades, inmate guards uh, were given guns um, to, you know, to guard other prisoners. If you tried to escape or if you worked the line or wherever you was in a dormitory, uh, you were guarded by mostly inmates. And a lot of time you were, you know, many people were killed by inmates who had the right to kill. But the uh, old rule inmates. was that if you as the pr inmate guard let a prisoner go while you were on duty, you picked up his sentence. Do you remember that one? That was, uh, that was the rule back in the... In the of course, that, uh, yeah, well, that was the, that was, that goes all the way back to long before Angola. <laughs> It goes back to a point where you were talking about um, where at one time during slavery there was, a, there was whites who also were allied and were helping um, some of the slaves escape. So what happened, um, a, a law was erected. That was sometime the latter part of the 17th century, I think, I'm not sure. But this law was, was uh, e erected that if uh, a person who was white aided a person of color to escape, then this individual would take the place of, of, and that eliminated quickly any whites at that time, that is openly trying to help any, any, any slave trying to escape from uh, slavery. This sort of stuff is still going on at Angola when I, just, just before I got there. Tell, tell us, you know, when you got there, in, uh, or around that time at least, when you sort of first became aware of the Black Panther ideology, for want of a better word. What was it that appealed to you about that? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I saw the, I saw the 10 point uh, platform, the program in which the, the Black Panther Party implemented. The first one was, it stated that we want freedom, we want power to determine our destiny. And 
for sure we did not have freedom, we did not have power to determine our destiny. I think it was the Black Panther Party was finding another way to say that it would love to, to get some of the democracy that um, um, America bragged about and America was noted for. Uh, they would love to get some of that democracy. So in saying that we want freedom, we want power to determine our, our destiny. Uh, we want an immediate end to police brutality in the community. You know, we want land, braid, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. You know, uh, and as our major political objective, a United Nations supervised plebiscite to be held throughout the community in which black subjects would be allowed to participate because at the time, um, and, and we referred to ourselves, or you and Newt referred to blacks as being black colonial subject because this is what we were. We was in a colony inside of, uh, of America, not having the right to vote, even have though you, we live in this democracy. Have you, have you ever had the right to vote? You know, ironically, ironically, I voted one time in my life, and that was, I did it for the, after I got out of prison. Of course, George Bush still won. I voted against him. <laughs> so my vote didn't count. No, you know, George a, Bush the second still won. It was a so, valiant effort, if I So, understand. yeah, so it, it didn't, my vote didn't count at all. And so I, I didn't, you know, no, I... I voted one time, but that was the only time. And I voted because I, I had some folks that, you know, y'all, I, I, and I thought it would probably be a, a thing. I just, I went ahead and I voted at that time. But, um, but you know, the felony disenfranchisement the, rule. In, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, the felony, I was out, you know, if you had a felony, you completed your sentence, sort of like after, I think maybe from four to five years, if you've been free of any felony, then you, you, could, you could vote. But it, all the time. But if you're on parole, you got to, you're on paper or something like that. If no, if you are not out in a in a in a uh, allotted amount of time, then no, you can't vote. But, but between the time that, in theory, you'd have had the right to vote, which would have been around about 1963, until the time you got out of prison, was there any time that you actually had the legal right to vote? No, never. Is that no? I mean, there's one of these arguments going on in Britain, which I just don't get, you English mm -hmm. people, about whether prisoners should have the right to vote. And it, David Cameron said it was the most offensive thing he'd ever heard, that, that right? a prisoner should be allowed the right to vote. How do you feel about that? Um, for the same reason, I, I feel that, that that argument goes on in the state. And I think there are some prisons, uh, uh, there are some states, rather, that allow prisoners who had been, you know, and I think they're trying to get this right again, that right in Angola. It has a group. I don't know if they have, well, no, they haven't totally have it, but they're trying to acquire that right. And for the same reason um, that I stated, uh, alluded to earlier, because what, um, like for instance, Angola, they are, they are not 5,000 people who live on the grounds of Angola, but nevertheless, it has taken, it's, it's a township and they count the inmates. And when they count the inmates in the, in, in, you, know, in, 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 you know, in the census, then the money that that's given to 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 to, to you know um, states and town that be, you know that 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 reach their township status, they get a certain amount of money from the, the federal government. So it is in their favor, you know, to do what they did. It's in their favor to to to, to count Angola residents when when it come down to them getting the money. They count all of Angola residents, including the, the prisoners, but they won't allow them to vote. And I think this is the leverage, this is the reasoning behind people who are pushing for, in Angola, um, for the right of prisoners to vote, because they count them in the census and they're getting that money from the federal government, but on the other hand, they won't let them vote. Now, how did the prison authorities at Angola respond to the Black Panthers? Um, I think at the time, it was a knee-jerk reaction, but it was also a level of paranoia after a point of time. It, for some reason, when I say paranoia, because not that there was, I didn't, when I don't, I don't mean scared. I mean, it was just uh, imagining all type of, you know, evils with the, you know, all type of acting with the Black Panther Party for some reason or another. Uh, and then again, they saw the Black Panther Party as being uh, uh, anybody, if you, it didn't make any difference. I remember Ralph Brown came through before the Black Panther Party emerged. Ralph Brown came through Baton Rouge and went, went through Angola, and he shook everything up, you know. Tell him who he is. Rap, well, Ralph Brown, he's now in Georgia. He's in prison. He's, he's imam something now, but uh, he wrote the, he, he written a book way back then, and he was one of the, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the, one of the ones who was, 
who was arrested as a result of after you know he was arrested in, for killing a, a allegedly participating in the death of policemen and so forth and some other people in the community. But the truth of the matter is, from what I gather, he was had become an imam and he was really doing things in the community and they saw Rabbi Brown as being a threat. But before all of this happened, you know, he did time in New York as well. Uh, he, and he got out and he opened up a shop, he went to Atlanta and he began to do some, some good things in the community. And so, but he had been a targeted um, um, a way back. But he came through Angola sometime around the 60s. He came to Baton Rouge. And, and that was the thing about him. Everybody, all the free people would say, you know, they would use him as a leverage. You know, we don't want no rap brown here in this here penitentiary. Uh, even if you wore your hair long, because Ralph Brown was one of the first to, to have a uh, sort of like an, an afro, and um, and he and and he wore it. But at that time, uh, the establishment, you know, um, saw this as as being a threat. And anybody who wore an afro at that time, it wasn't until Elaine Hunt came and gave people the right to grow afro and so forth. But they used to just cut everybody hair off because it was a threat. It was a, a somehow if you wore long hair then you were somehow a, quote, militant, and you was a threat. You, and they were, you know, you, were, you, would, you would be a target. Mm -hmm. They're doing that in Guantanamo right now. Um, and I, I know most people here will be familiar with the whole Angola 3 thing, but tell them just a little bit about, you know, how the, the three of you guys ended up uh, in solitary. Well, um, I ended up in solitary because I was a member of the Black Panther Party. Uh, they recognized that I became a member of the Black Panther Party while I was still uh, in a past prison. Uh, but more so, I think they recognized that I had, be you know, become a member of, I hope this is what they did anyway, because I saw myself as being more than just a member of some organization. I think I, by this time I had become politically aware and I was, um, you know, after becoming politically aware, I had joined the struggle. It wasn't any single organization that I joined. I had, my, my views had, had sort of broadened a little bit. And so um, I, I saw myself as, as, as being a person who, who had really uh, joined the struggle once I got to, once I got to prison. And I think the, uh, the prison recognized this too. And, and even though um, I was not in prison when Herman and Albert, the other two members of the Angola Three, I did not, uh, I entered the prison when they entered the prison. I was not placed in um, the man stream population. I wasn't. I wasn't. I was not placed in population at all. Um, when they sent me from the Paris prison in New Orleans, they sent me straight to uh, CCR, which means closed cell restriction, which is a form of solitary confinement, where they had picked Herman and Albert and, and a few hundred more people and placed them in solitary confinement as a result of. Um, uh, a guard being uh, found slain in one of the dormitories. Uh, the first people to suspect were members of the Black Panther Party. So Herman when, and Albert. When, when the guard was killed, where were it you? It was in 19, April 1972, and at the time I was still in the New Orleans Pad prison. And so uh, how was it that you came to be a suspect? I mean, it's quite hard to commit a murder when you're 128 well, was, miles away. Yeah, well, nevertheless, uh, I was 100, like I say, 50 so miles away. Nevertheless, I was. Um, charged uh, uh, under an investigation, not charged with this particular incident, but I may as well have been charged with it uh, and convicted for it because I stayed, um, you know, in the CCR under investigation for more than two decades for mm -hmm. a crime that took place before I had even entered the prison. Right. And what about Herman and Albert? How did they end up there? Herman and Albert because of, you know, um, they were allegedly, as a result of inmate uh, testimony, people who had been paid for and uh, for testimony. Uh, Hezekiah Brown is one uh, whose, by the way, credibility has been undermined, and Albert case has been overturned, and the courts have been, you know. But at that time, yeah, it was as a result of uh, people like Hezekiah Brown, who had initially uh, did not know anything or say they did not was in the dormitory at the time that this uh, alleged murder occurred. Uh, said he did not know anything about it, and it wasn't until some uh, day or so, two or three days later, that after a further internal investigation and, and further coercion and brutality by prison officials, 
uh, in talking to and interrogating people and getting people to say certain things. Herman and Albert and two more people who were also affiliated with the Black Panther Party, their names came up in, mm -hmm. in, in the process. And this is how Herman and Albert uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, ended up being charged, being charged and subsequently convicted. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of all those years, uh, describe just for a minute what solitary confinement is like. Just describe physically, you know, as vis-a-vis -vis these people in their toilets, for example. <clears throat> I mean, how big were the places you were held? Well, solitary confinement in, in you know, it, it, it probably, you know, differ in, in some state, but uh, America-style solitary confinement, or in some countries, I don't know, America-style solitary confinement it's like people are, are housed uh, in closed security cells, and you're in your cell basically uh, 23 hours a day. And if you were in Angola, you was in a 6 by 9 by 12 foot cell for 23 hours a day, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes 24. And there were, you know, there were no way of, of being released from this type of environment. If you had life, uh, the idea was to do life in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. If you had 100 years, do whatever you could in a situation like that. And if you were considered a security threat or security risk, uh, where you could look to do a, the rest of your, your life mm. in closed cell restriction. And uh, in a place like that, you have bare necessities. You have a bunk. Sometimes you have a mattress. You have a, a change of, uh, you know, maybe a sheet and a blanket. You, it depends on the period of time Sometimes you're allowed to have six books. Sometimes you're allowed to have four books, a Bible, and a dictionary. Um, the, everywhere you go, you're handcuffed, you're shackled. You, the, the, the clothes that you have are very, um, very limited. When you go in a yard, you, you leave by yourself. They shackle you. Even though you've been in your cell for, you know, for months, years, probably without going anywhere. Or uh, if you go in a yard, um, you, they're going to shake you down, and you're going to get a skin search. Uh, yes, tell them, of course. Tell, I mean, you know, when you say skin search, what well, do you mean? Well, I say that? skin is probably more than that is, uh, is they gonna, they, because they go through, it's just not really skin, because a skin search is when you just take off all your clothes, but they uh, bring you through uh, different type of searches. You, sometimes they look at cavity, um, open they, your mouth, raise your arm, they look in your animals, you know, yeah. you know mm -hmm. in animals. So these are type of things that go on. It's more for humili humiliation than anything. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason we, uh, we did a thing that, to try to eliminate that, and we did. Uh, uh, we went to court, uh, we challenged uh, the routine uh, rectal search because, like I said, everywhere we went, we were, all, we were always handcuffed, shackled. If we went, those, those of us who was fortunate to, to maybe make a phone call to a lawyer at that time, you know, you went out handcuffed, you know, you came back, they didn't take the cuffs off you, but nevertheless, when you came back to your, your location, they wanted to bring you, just to humiliate you, to bring you through the, 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 the routine animal search, right. mm -hmm. even though you never had the handcuffs off you. So we challenged that, and we won it part of the way um, in, in a deal. Uh, it was uh, Wood Fox and all, and I was a part of the Sioux as well. Wood Fox and all voices. Right. I think it was some Phelps or something. You know, and they do all of that stuff in Guantanamo, of course, and some of the prisoners I've uh, been visiting down there for 10 years you know, of just getting psychotic mm -hmm. from that whole process. Tell me what it does to your mind to be in isolation for an extended period. We're not going to judge your sanity now. You've had plenty of time to, uh, <laughs> to regain Oh, no, no. I, hey, I, <laughs> I'll be the first to tell you. <laughs> don't tell me I, I, that I'm not. I'll be the first to tell you. No, in the world, you get dipped in waste and not come up stinking. Mm -hmm. So when you say, I, if you've been in there that long, and why aren't you crazy? I ain't going to tell you I'm not crazy. I have no <laughs> excuse, though. I don't know what yeah, my I, excuse I, I ain't going to tell you I'm not crazy. Ain't no way in the world you can, mm -hmm. a person can go through that type of ordeal and not come up, you know, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me, how did I endure? Yeah. Well, I, I imagine I kind of rose above that. Uh, I, I didn't endure. Uh, I just kind of insulated myself, maybe seeing other people, what it does to other, to other people. But at the same time, I had become politically aware and politically conscious. Uh, and I was in prison. Prison wasn't in me. That's the difference. I think my mindset had changed totally because I saw that I was really, um, um, you know, a victim of the system. I had saw myself as, like I said, as being a victim of the system. And so what I was doing was, was you know, uh, I, I, being in prison, I was there because 
I, and then again, I had begun to look at society um, at that time in which I lived. I had begun to see that as one big prison, and they had plucked me from minimum custody, which was society, and had placed me in maximum security. So with my mind set, fact that, set on the fact that America was one big prison, and it dawned on me that, well, anyway, you are in prison. It really don't make a difference. Just struggle. So the idea was to for me to struggle to get out of prison. And I think with this mindset, it kind of, I'm not saying I, with this mindset that I had, I think it helped me to kind of, you know, uh, you know, get over the hump. Not so much as, you know, endure, but get over the hump. What about, you know, some of the people who would be your supporters on the outside? You know, how, how does that help? Or how did that help? How does that help Albert and Herm, Herman these days? How did, how do what help them? You know, having people on the outside. Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, I, I think you could have no greater asset, you know, and, and if you really want some uh, upliftment or psychological, physical, whatever you want to call it, to, to have someone on the outside to, you know, to care. Just a letter, sometimes just a letter. Um, I've seen letters save the lives of a lot of people, people who are, you know, I mean, really destitute for uh, any type of affection. Uh, a letter from a, a loved one. Uh, have stopped them from probably doing a lot of things, either committing suicide or putting themselves in a position for someone else to commit a murder on them, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you hear these people banging on it drives me insane about, uh, you know, it's not tough enough to just give him 50 years in prison or whatever. You did, on just this one stretch, um, basically from age roughly 28 to about age 59, is that right? Yeah, I think more like... 26th or 59th, okay. something like that. Something what like is, that. You know, you, I always like to get people to think about those of us, well, I'm not quite that old yet, but those of us who were at least once 26 and uh, are now significantly older, to think about missing all of that time, at least in minimum security as opposed to maximum security. How do you feel about that, you know, the, the part of your life that was just taken away in that sense? Enormous amount of time, isn't it? Yeah, yes it is, but you don't, <clears throat> um, after a while, you know, time sort of, you kind of, you know, one day is like the other day. Um, at least that's the way it was for me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it did not make any difference if it was Monday or Sunday, if it was Easter or Christmas, it was still the same day for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, had, I had stopped putting a lot of emphasis on the days, mm -hmm. uh, uh, even the amount of time now, I, I just know one thing, one day followed the next. And so I think, you know, these, I mean, I, I had to change my mindset about, uh, about, about prison and, <clears throat> and um, what it was. And I imagine this kind of thing sort of helped me. Um, and I guess right. you had to change your mindset a whole other time when you finally got out 10 years ago. How was that? Well, when you say change my mindset. Or change something, I don't know what you changed. No, I, what I did, I think when I, once I got out, you know, and by this time we had begun to get support uh, from people. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we had, we had, we had, we had, we had, you know, begun to garner quite a few letters from, you know. So when I got out, I kind of got the idea that, you know, at one time, I felt that the struggle really was, quote, dead, you know. Mm -hmm. But then it dawned on me when, you know, uh, people got interested in our cases and we kept hearing about other cases. We felt that, you know, it, it wasn't dead. Uh, we did some things to try to, you know, to, 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 to kind of help to expedite things in, on our own behalf. We, uh, we did some things in prison, you know, to kind of, you know, bring things along or help things along. And I think this was, this was the consolation that we had, had uh, the, 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 we consoled ourselves in the fact that we were able to help ourselves and that we had people on the outside who had got on board who were also willing uh, to help. So it meant a lot for people, you know, on the outside to get involved, even if it's just a, um, uh, whether it's a family member, uh, just a friend or someone writing another prisoner. What's the focus of your life been, though, for the last 10 years when you've been on the outside? Well, I guess basically the focus of my life has been, I imagine, uh, to try to uh, secure the release of, uh, keep, the, keep focus on the case of Herman and Albert and secure 
bill release. But in the process of doing this, I also realized that we are just a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main focus is to, you know, to, to, to look at prison period in the United States. Um, as being in, as again, as I say, and I don't want to get off into your book and how you put it, but it's a form <laughs> of slavery, you know. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. That is my, that has been my focus for, for you know, for for years. But I mean, when people when people think about this as a sort of something that happened in 1972, and it, it's still going on in uh, Angola, isn't it? I mean, there's there's the Angola three. Then we've now got the Angola five, and they're doing it all to these guys again. It hasn't changed. Do you ever get a sense, I mean, there's sort of survivor's guilt. Do you get a sense of, of somehow guilt that you're out and the other guys are still there? Um, I think that, you know, I'm only human, you know, and I imagine that would come out. I, I, I do think, you know, I, I do feel, you know, I do feel a little, for want of a better word, mm -hmm. guilty. Uh, you shouldn't, by the way. Let me just I, make that clear. I, yeah, I, mm -hmm. and I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I do, <laughs> 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 I do feel. Uh, I, I do. I had even said this that um, if you know, if I could, you know, if it was possible to give Herman and Albert um, a day or a week. You know, well, you'd change places. I would, boy, but they have this. Uh, they have to show me that they're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that that would be pretty hard to do I, if it was me. <laughs> if it was me, if somebody, I, I, so I'm sorry, bro. <laughs> now, <there's> an, <laughs> I, I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, we lock the doors and these people can't leave without buying your book. But I, I'm just going to make another announcement now, which is we've locked the doors and these people can't leave until they promise what they're going to do for, you know, not just uh, Herman and Albert, but the other people in a similar si situation. What would you tell them? as advice to them about what they need to promise to me in order to get out of the room. What should they do to help people under those circumstances? The promise. To, no, I, this I'm is just... You just use it. I've learned a lot from the American government about torture, and one of the things I've learned is the way I can abuse people under these... You know, they can't leave until they agree to do what I tell them to do. And I'm only joking, but seriously, okay. what is the... What, what would you tell folk that they should be doing? Well, I would tell people to, you know, to, to uh, get involved in the case, go to our website, see our case, not just our case, but our case, you know, Amnesty has taken on, you know, our case, has seen it as a, as a catalyst to kind of reflect and highlight uh, abuses in, you know, in other areas. So I would tell people to go to the, the website. Of course, we have, we have calls and postcards that people can sign. I see I usually club let other people do this because they are more familiar with my schedule, really, than I am. I don't even know where, I, where I'm going tomorrow. The, I didn't know I was coming to this spot tonight. If someone asked me the next 20 minutes from now where I've been, I still <laughs> wouldn't know. Dang, so you think that's better so coming from some other. I do whatever <laughs> my wife tell, tells me to do. That's all right. That's, it's, always, it's all the same. Look, um, but in terms of just things like one of the things I think is very important over the years, the, there have been 5,000 British people, for example, who just write letters to prisoners on death row or in American prisons. You know, what sort of, when you receive that sort of letter from abroad, you know, just discussing whatever these people are doing in Britain, what, what impact does that have on you? It has a lot of impact, a lot of psychological impact on a, on a, on a person, uh, uh, you know, mental state, I imagine, because it, it tells or reflect that people care. Mm -hmm. And I think it's when people know that there's someone on the outside that really cares that all of, in the, you know, in the midst of all that's going on, there is a voice, you know, as someone who really cares, who have shown that they care. I think, you know, this, this uplift a person mentally and psychologically. Well, I mean, what we'll do is if anyone gives us trouble, I'll put them on cross-examination about what their talents are and we'll, we'll get them to promise some other things to do. But why don't we throw it open to people in the floor about comments, questions, whatever. Ah, and the microphone is coming around. <coughs> just very quickly. Why don't you introduce yourself Sorry. when you, um, just so we know who we're going to, you um, know, My name is Luke Douglas Hugh, um, freelance journalist, but just, um, just 
fascinated by how you deal with anger. I would just be, I, I'd be so angry, I wouldn't be able to string a sentence together. But you seem to me like a, a very straightforward gentleman. And yet I'd be just so angry, I'd be speechless. I am so angry, but I'm not <laughs> speechless. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I understand your, your point, and thanks for the thanks for your your your, your point. And I think it's uh, your statement. I think it's a question. I imagine you wonder why I'm not angry. Well, I didn't say I wasn't angry. I, I'm, you know what I'm saying? Um, I am. You know, I I I am angry, and I think, uh, but I'm not bitter or anger to the point where it can it can it can probably deter. You know um, what I think I I need to focus on, and I think I need to the the focus on those circumstances. You know which you know I was I was in that I really should not have been in those circumstances. The idea is to, to make sure that this does not happen, or to try to undermine you know the forces that uh, that 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 bring you know these circumstances into being that uh, allow a person to go through the thing that I've been through. So that's, I think, you know, looking at it from that angle, I can't allow myself <clears throat> to become angered to the point of, of being deterred from, 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 from what I need to do. I think I, there was a, a need after doing 31 years in, in prison under the circumstances in which I did to come out and live a sedated lifestyle. It just wasn't, it would, it would, it would say that everything that I, that I fought for in prison, and we fought for a lot of things in prison. You would say everything that I fought for, if I allow anger and bitterness to, to defeat that, you know, defeat my purpose now, I think it would be for note. And I, I don't want my, my, even though my years were in prison, and it was 31 years spent unjustly in prison, I don't want those 31 years to be wasted. I think if I acted in a manner that, that, that was, not progressive, I would waste those years. Hmm. Okay, sorry. Sam. Um, my name is Eric Gordon. Um, I saw a news clip the other day about the rodeo shows hmm. at Angola. I was a bit late this evening, so I don't know whether it was uh, described earlier, but I'd like to know a bit more about them because they look pretty barbaric. <laughs> I... Tell them about the Angola rodeo. They well, never let you I can go. only tell you what I saw because I, I, I have, they, they didn't allow us to go to the rodeos, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that um, that Angola prison rodeo is, a, is, a, is something that, you know, I think for some reason the warden, Burr Kane, he's the warden of Angola, he feels that uh, the rodeo is a gift of God to prisoners and it's a gift of God, you know, for him because he considered himself you know, the god of the rodeo, somebody considered him the god of the rodeo. So. <laughs> he considers himself the god of a little bit more than the rodeo. <laughs> more than just the rodeo, he's, uh, you know. So, but the rodeo is, is, is I think it's, you know, uh, according to Burl Kane. And I, like I said, we only, we weren't allowed, and even if we would have been allowed to, uh, to go to a rodeo um, uh, or to participate in it, we would not have uh, uh, done so because um, I, saw, I, saw the, I saw the rodeo Personally, I saw the rodeo as being um, akin to um, gladiators in a in a Roman arena. Um, people uh, people on beeline, people are clapping. They want to see a a, a a a bull just hit the individual, and this individual is mangled for the rest of his life. A, a lot of time, you know, you talk to some of the inmates, uh, some of the prisoners. Uh, you don't, you don't, you know, in the morning advocate, the Baton Rouge paper, uh, after a rodeo, you don't see anything in there about injuries of prisoners or prisoners dying as a result of the injury because they hide it. But there has been quite a few, more than a few prisoners who actually die from their injuries, who actually get injured, but they play down as if no one is injured, that it is, it is a, is a, is, is, you know, that it's a game, that People play, people, and prisoners love to play. This is their moment in the sun, you know. Of course, Burkhan has said this, in, you know, that this is their moment in the sun, and they enjoy doing this. So if they get man broken up, 
you know, when the rodeo voice opened, it was sometime in 61 or 62, and there was a bull, and they called a bull Freedom. And they called a bull Freedom for a reason. It was about a 4,000 pound bull, three, 4,000 pound bull. They used to take a hundred dollar beer and put it in the in the horns of a, I think they might do 200 now. Mm -hmm. they take a hundred dollar bill and put it between the horn and, and one person would go out there and get it off a raging bull who was angry, who had, sees nothing but red, you know, and trying to kill anything in its way. And they send people out there and they have guys because a hundred dollars is a hundred dollars in prison. I mean, it's like having big time money. You live high off the what they call the hog if you got a hundred dollars in prison. Guys didn't, don't have anything else to look forward to. So the rodeo is, you know, when you really look at it, it's, you know, it's, I don't, the only, I can only equate it to, you know, uh, the, the, a period of Roman gladiator, you know, gladiators in the ring fighting, entertaining uh, a group of people who, who, who delight in, you know, in seeing that type of stuff, seeing people broken up and mangled and being thrown 40, 50 feet in the air and being stumped on by bulls. Yeah, who's next? Thank you. Um, Sylvia Coleman. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question for Robert or for you, Clive, but could you explain a little bit about the progress of the case and, and generally with this type of um, situation, why it is that these cases take so very many years to actually progress. You go first, and then I'll give them chapter 13 of my thrilling best life. <laughs> so the, the, the basic question is why do why these does cases take so take long, and what's going on? Well, you know, for one thing, there are probably a number of reasons we could come up with as to why. Uh, when you're dealing with what they call high profile cases and and Herman and Albert case and Albert Angle the three cases sort of like a high profile case not made high profile by us actually it was when we filed we initially filed it wasn't about anything about the, the, the Black Panthers it was the Julie Cullen the uh, then Attorney General who brought in that she was going to try Albert because you know he was a member of the Black Panther Party and he did this and you know and you know, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so, you know, thus the case went, and its history is, is, is like that now. So the case has become high profile. The state has backed itself in a corner. Um, in backing itself in a corner, it has, a, a, you know, when I say the state, I ain't, I ain't talking about the judges because the judges have, have been really friendly. It's people, like I say, Buddy Caldwell, people who have made their careers you know, um, on this case. Um, John Sinkerfew was the <laughs> initial attorney on this case. He was a young fledgling prosecutor along with a, another attorney named uh, Leon Pico, if you remember him. They were the one who tried this case. After trying this case, but they like went John on. Sinkfield tried me too. He <laughs> took me on trial one time. I got acquitted <laughs> amazingly. <enough. laughs> mm. But they, they went on to make careers, you know, out of their profession in, in, in prosecutorial misconduct. It didn't make any difference. They wanted to secure conviction and it doesn't, if they went through dirty means or to secure conviction, uh, so be it. So, you know, cases like, like, like they ain't the three. I mean, if you look at Geronimo D. Jaga, he took 27 years for him to get out of prison. He was framed by the FBI. He was 350 miles away. And they know he was 350 miles away. And they had him killing two people. And it wasn't until Johnny Cochran uh, got the FBI to give the tape that had him under surveillance at the time that they say the FBI say he was committing a, a, a murder. So, I mean, these high profile cases, it took a while for him to get out because the state did not want to be wrong. John Sinkerfield didn't want to be wrong and his partner who came up behind him, which is Buddy Caldwell, their friends. You know, uh, Buddy Caldwell, John Sinkerfield made his career on, on, on prosecutorial misconduct and especially this case. And so what is, um, Buddy Caldwell is following in his footsteps. They're boom tight partners. And it, you know, it doesn't make any difference if, you know, there are countervailing evidence which 
surfaced and shows that there was a miscarriage of justice performed in the case, uh, they have to validate their careers. With, with, without a conviction, their conviction is invalid, uh, you know, and so they have to continue. So you have to look, I, I was there for, uh, like I said, 31 years, you know, and they know I hadn't done anything, you know. It takes longer. The case become higher profile, and I think when it, but I do, the higher profile, the higher the case become in public, I think that is more of a demand that the public should be behind the case because this is the only way a case like this, a high profile case like this, if it's out in the public, uh, in, it has to stay under the public microscope to make so that the, the courts and the state does the right thing. If there is a case, because it's not going to be tried just in a court of law. I don't know no other high profile case. Reuben Hurricane Carter, his case was, even though it was tried in a court of law, it, was, it took people you know, to get on board to get him out. The, like I say, the San Francisco 8, it took people to get on board to get them out. These high profile cases, they need, they need the legal aspect of it, but they also need the grassroots aspect of it. I think the two work in conjunction. And I think with both working together, I think it may expedite the case, but then the state is still reluctant. The state don't want to admit that they are wrong, so I think people have to be more persistent. Because if the case become higher profile, and the state is allowed to shut people up, then we've lost. The people that we're trying to fight for are lost. So we, are, if we have to go at it, continue to go at it, and it has to be fought on all fronts. We have to understand that we are, that this is an a adversary of testing. This is an arena where law, lawyer and where defense lawyers, they act out a, a, a game of warfare, intellectual warfare. And it has to be fought. And you have to understand that they're, they're adversaries. They are not bed partners. They are not friends. They don't go out and, you know, on, on the Gulf Coast together and, and sleep in a bed together. No. They have to be adversarial. If they're anything but adversarial, there is a flaw. Something is wrong. To, to answer your question in another way, um, actually, the people who, after 40 years, are still in court are incredibly lucky. Because the problem in America um, is a systematic one where the whole system is rigged to screw people over. So, for example, if you want to think about the three stupidest opinions over simply a seven-year period in the United States Supreme Court, they would be these. First, Giratano versus Murray that says that if you're in prison, you've been convicted and you've had your, your one appeal, then from now on in, you've got to represent yourself, even if you're on death row. A death row prisoner under American US constitutional law has no right to a lawyer. That's why you're dependent so often on, on do-gooders like me. And so that's your first problem. You don't have a lawyer. And so you, know, you go up to prison, very often having very little education, let alone legal education, and suddenly you're meant to represent yourself. Your second problem is that if you don't, under the uh, Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, if you don't bring your appeal within one year, then you're forever barred from ever raising legal issues again. So, you know, you arrive in Angola with no knowledge about anything, and you're meant to do it all yourself, and you've got a year to do it. And next, you have no right to, uh, to any investigative assistance. So you're sitting in some solitary cell in CCR in Angola, and you're meant to you know, get the evidence that's going to prove your innocence within a year. We, when we sued them on this in Mississippi, we asked that the death row prisoners should be allowed a, a little weekend furlough to go out and do investigation, because how else were they meant to do it? I mean, it's ludicrous. The second unbelievably stupid opinion that the US Supreme Court decided in the same time frame was Herrera versus Collins which says that whether you're guilty or not is not constitutionally relevant to whether you should be executed or whether you should spend the rest of your life in prison. Now, Sylvia, would you like to explain to me why that is? Come on, tell me why that's the law in America. Surely it's obvious. <laughs> You're struggling. I'm struggling. Would you like me to? <laughs> I mean, at least yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm well, struggling to say it in a way that would be appropriate so to, this the, is, this, <laughs> to this the room. This is the law in America today, Herrera versus Collins, 
and this came up in Troy, in Troy Davis's case last the, uh, two weeks ago. Whether you're guilty or not is not constitutionally relevant to whether you should be executed or whether you should spend the rest of your life in it prison. Turns, are you being in terms of what the Supreme Court had interpreted? There is no, there is no constitutional right yeah. to be uh, set free if you're innocent. There is no such right. And indeed, so, in Troy Davis's case, and I, I've known Troy, or I did know Troy, since I was in Georgia in 19, well, before he ended up on death row, you know, the argument made in Troy's case was that if the judge was 60% certain he was innocent, then he shouldn't be executed. That was the argument made by the defense. The judge, the judge rejected that and said, no, no, no. You know, we have yet to recognize any issue of innocence, and indeed, if you're 60% sure, that's not good enough. In other words, if you toss a coin where you have a 50-50 chance of getting the right answer, you're more likely to get it right than the Georgia judicial system after 20 years of appeals. So that's your second problem is that innocence is not legally relevant. So we win cases on all sorts of ridiculous things about, you know, whether, for example, Ricky Langley, who was a white male, had you know, black women on his grand jury, for goodness sake. You win it on bizarre things if you have a decent lawyer. But you can't win it on the most substantive issue of all because it's just not legally relevant under federal law. Well, it's not legally valid because... Because there's no Supreme such right. The Supreme Court has not ruled on it. it they have ruled on it. nothing to do with what was written at the end of the 18th century. No, no, no. But, you know, Justice Scalia's argument on that, just to set it in, in perspective for you, is that there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution that says, thou shalt not punish an innocent person. So therefore, according to Scalia's perverse interpretation of the world, there is no legal right. Now, you know, we might point out to Scalia that actually there's nothing in the Constitution that says the sun should rise every day either. There are some things that are so fundamentally obvious to all of us that presumably people would recognize them. Unfortunately, the US legal system doesn't recognize them. Um, I won't go into the third, although it's a favorite subject of mine. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yes, and true, just to get on that, you know, innocence is, isn't a claim. But there, there is a case, Sloop versus Dello, 1991 Missouri case, that allow a person to color, and I use it in my case, to color your claim with innocence. If evidence was omitted that you could, that, that, that you were, weren't allowed to present, and this is a, a United States Supreme Court case, if evidence were omitted that, that, that should have been, you know, admitted during trial, if this evidence could secure your conviction, you can go back to court or go to court for the first time and color your claim with innocence. And while innocence is not a claim, you can color your claim with innocence and the court have a tendency to entertain the claim. And this is how they entertain my claim because it was colored uh, with innocence, not because they felt, and of course the justices look at the evidence against me and saw that this you know, was, you know, that, 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 that something was amiss, but that, you know, like legality, I mean, you know, I mean, uh, 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 innocence is not, a, is not a legal claim. Schlup versus Delo holds only one thing, which is that if you're procedurally defaulted, and this is this bizarre thing that's come up um, that should have been left in the era of Henry IV, that if you, and procedural default says this, if you have a shit lawyer at trial, then your probability of you getting convicted is vastly inflated. But because your lawyer at trial fails to object, then you've got no issues you can raise on appeal because they're procedurally defaulted because your lawyer failed to object to them at trial. What Schloop says is that you can arguably get around procedural default on, a, on an issue if you can prove such a high degree of innocence that we should therefore revisit the some bizarre claim, but if you have a perfect, you know, if it, it's, look, f for goodness sake, it, this drives me insane and I don't want to bore you with, with all of this stuff, but uh, the procedural rules in American law are such that there has never yet been a person executed in America who would not have won but for the fact that their lawyers failed to raise the claim in a timely fashion. In other words, every single person who's been executed to date had a claim that if they had a competent lawyer to raise it, 
they would, in, and it had been raised in a timely fashion, they would have won. It's, this, it's incredibly arcane rubbish. I don't want to bore you on, but, um, but anyway, that's the, the bottom line of it. So the long and the short of it is that of the 5,000 people in Angola who are serving all of them the equivalent of life in prison, the vast majority are serving life without the possibility of parole, of those 5,000 people, the lucky ones, are the ones who are still in court after 40 years. The vast majority are not. My wife set up an innocence project in New Orleans to represent the people who were serving life. I was representing the ones on death row, but Anne was doing the ones who were serving life. And the first 13 people she represented, every single one got exonerated in the end. But they hadn't. They'd served. Some of them, you knew some of them, had spent 27 years in prison for something they didn't do because they hadn't had a lawyer and they hadn't had any, anyone on their side. And when we were doing a little experiment in New Orleans um, in 1999 to 2002, we represented 171 people facing capital charges in New Orleans. And, and my little charity investigated the hell out of their cases and just, you know, determined from the moment they were arrested whether they'd got the right person. And then we just turned that evidence over to the prosecution and let them decide whether they had the right person. Of 171 people, we proved to the prosecution's satisfaction that they'd got the wrong person in 126 cases. 74.9% of those cases, they'd arrested the wrong person for, cap for a capital charge. One person out of 171 was convicted of first degree murder and got life in prison. 170 didn't. That shows you the difference between the sort of representation you can get that gets justice versus the sort of representation that 5,000 people rotting away in Angola got. And, you know, look, frankly, I could care less whether people are innocent or not because I think the whole thing's rotten. But uh, the, the number of innocent people in Angola is phenomenal. And while I think it's fantastic that people support the Angola, the, the Angola too, uh, we need to do a whole lot for the Angola 4,998. Sorry, this guy gets me annoyed. You talk about getting angry, it gets very pissed off when I, you know, whatever, yeah. I feel, my name's Jennifer. I, I feel that this question might be a little bit more frivolous, but since it's very newsy, I feel that I'm compelled to ask it, and you'll all be grateful that I have. <laughs> um, with what we saw last night in Perugia, and Amanda Knox and Raffaele Scalacito walking out of their sentences, and with this discussion of whether or not innocence matters, I'd be interested for your thoughts on, uh, on that case and on that process. You're speaking about Amanda Knox and, uh, yeah. and, and what is it you want to know about her? What your response was, what do you think about it? Yeah, well, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't see the, when I left the States, I seen, I haven't, I haven't watched the TV since. I've been here about three or four days, so I don't know the results. But if you ask me what I, what I think about the case at, you know, having previously heard what I, um, I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know Italy. I don't know Italy, uh, Italian law. Um, I, um, but I do, uh, I, 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 I can't, I don't know whether she was, you know, whether she was given due process because I don't know what type of due process Italy, Italy has. I don't know the results. I couldn't say the results of what happened. I know she had some movement, um, you know, in the last week or so, but, Maybe Clive could tell you. I'm not. Only thing I know, she got 25 years. I know the prosecutor was asking that, as a result of her going back on so-called new evidence, that they were trying to give her a life sentence. I don't even know if that happened. Whether the prosecutor succeeded in doing that or not, maybe she worked for yesterday. But I tell you, one of the things to me on that whole process, I'm very pleased for her that she did because I'd have quit the woman in a heartbeat based on what I know about the case. But. It was, uh, and I'm really glad she had the support from America that she had, because that's really good, and that's the sort of support everyone in prison should get, because the word criminal is a word that is offensive. We could go into it in great depth, but you can just wait for chapter 15 of the upcoming. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry. But look, it was astounding to me, the criticism that people leveled at the Italian judicial system, because thank God, after you know, four years as opposed to 40 years in these other guys' case, they came to a reasonable result. And what makes you, you know, want to vomit on one level is the people back in the US, and I speak as an American on this, that, who are criticizing the, the <laughs> Italian system when 
Troy Davis just <laughs> got killed and never got anything like that process in the American judicial system. So, you know, I'm, I'm really happy for her, and I think it's great, and I think it's, it, 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 it's, it's wonderful that the Italians did that eventually. But what we need to do is, is look with a certain degree of irony about the criticism leveled against the Italian system when we look at the, at the US. Because look, you talk about that DNA stuff, everyone thinks DNA is all so wonderful and the Italians botched it and this, that and the other. I can tell you that the first three death penalty cases I had in the United States where they used DNA, I know they got the wrong answer. Um, and it was actually incredibly helpful to me on a couple of the cases. But, you know, the idea that we're criticizing their system is, is beyond me. And I have a slightly soft spot for the Italians, let's face it. <laughs> uh, Nina Kowalska, I've been working on the campaign with Robert and others for a, a few years, so I know a little bit about it. Um, Robert, could you tell us what, where things are currently with Herman and Albert's cases and what you think their chances of freedom are? And secondly, um, there is a third case that you were yourself involved in, which is currently pending, which is Angola 3 versus Louisiana for cruel and unusual punishment. So can you kind of take us up to date with where things are? Um, yes, right. At this point in time, um, as you know, our Albert case was overturned for a minute. Um, since that time, it was reinstated by the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. And right now he is back in the district court and a hearing is about to, um, to take place sometime, I believe, um, if not December, sometime in January or February. Um, the judge, in, um, I think he intend to, to rule on the issue. In, involve, it's a procedure issue and it, it involving, it, it involved, I think, the jury, um, whether or not there were, you know, uh, women's on the grand jury um, that indicted, uh, indicted Albert. That's one of the issues that, that they're looking at. And, but um, I think Albert, I spoke to Albert a few days ago, and, and even though he's, you know, disappointed that things <clears throat> hasn't moved, you know, along the way in which they probably could have, uh, he's still excited about the prospect, the end prospect. He feels his, his expectation is still great that he feels that he is going to be at some point um, released from prison. So we are at, we're still at, we're still in the process. We, he is back in the middle district, uh, in the middle district court. Herman is also in the middle district court. Herman had had some recommendation. He had some positive results in his case as well over the, the last couple of years. A magistrate. Uh, recommended that he get a new trial. Of course, um, the judge did not agree with his magistrate, which is quite unusual. Uh, the case went to the Louisiana Supreme Court, and in a two-to-one decision, uh, there were only one one dissent, and that was the the minority dissent that wanted to give uh, agreed that Herman should get a new trial. The other two judges who denied Herman a new trial. Uh, they denied without any, 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 you know, any comment. Um, so Herman is now, you know, and he has some issues, some of the same issues that, that Albert have. You know, they didn't go to trial. Many people think that they went to trial together, so they went up the judicial ladder differently. Um, and so they are in, you know, different courts at different times. Um, uh, Albert is beyond Herman at some point, and then Herman catches up with Albert. At this point in time, Herman case could be, uh, rule on. So um, right now they are still legally, you know, alive. We managed to keep, and that's the thing that Clyde was speaking about, uh, that procedural ball. Uh, we have managed to keep keep their cases alive, for, uh, which is quite uh, unusual. And that is only because, uh, you know, that clock, judicial clock, which, which is we're technical. I won't even go into that. But we managed to keep their, the cases, um, you know, Alive. With regards to the civil suit in which I'm a part of, um, that is something that was about 12, maybe 13 years old. We filed, um, and this was pertaining to our um, condition, not our sentences, but the condition that we were under while being held in, you know, in, um, in Angola. 
Uh, and the code has ruled, the magistrate has ruled, uh, indicated that the length of time in which we were, uh, in which I was housed, you know, which was 29 years in solitary confinement, constituted cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, of course, the code has, in my opinion, and you could correct me, has never said that. I don't know no law that, that says that, you know, uh, uh, you know, four, five, six years of uh, a law against a person being subjected to cruel and unusual punishment in prison. But in our case, it, it didn't say that cruel and unusual punishment was unconstitutional per se. What it did say and indicated, and to my knowledge, it stated that the length of time in which we were held in those conditions, <clears throat> it constituted cruel and unusual punishment, which tells me that they can tolerate up to a certain point of time. So our case, hopefully, will be, you know, if it goes to trial, it will be, you know, uh, use a set of precedent to eliminate Angola and other prisoners around the country from keeping people uh, in those type of condition in which uh, Herman and Albert remain in, in which I uh, was in for, for that period of time. So we are trying to get them to set this uh, precedent. And the case right now, uh, from what I am told, is it's moving along. Uh, the judge who had the case, <clears throat> he recently um, he recently died, um, and so the case now, as you know, uh, he had come to the council for a couple of years, so the case laid low for a minute, and and in any event, uh, we it's moving now, and uh, I'm told that sometime probably in the next few months, uh, even before that uh, before that period that there will be more movement. I thank the, the judge that we have now. Uh, he want to probably litigate the case. And I think from what I gather, he's, uh, he's kind of frustrated a little bit because Buddy Caldwell has, you know, implemented or inserted himself not only in the criminal case, but he's also a part of the civil case. And he has been impeding some of the probably some of the, pro the progress or the process of the civil case. But that's another story. But yeah, this is where we are. Uh, and I'm a part of that, uh, of that civil suit. Don't know when it's going to go to trial, but it, it, it it's scheduled to go to trial. Uh, they uh, they started back to negotiate. And I don't know what it's, the negotiation is going to be, but it is my hope that we can go to uh, trial pretty soon. If we go to trial, we go pretty soon, and that we set this precedent that is needed. Uh, they won't be able to, to hold people in in you know solitary confinement or in places that is you know considered solitary confinement for you know uh, just a uh, you know. Uh, unduly length of time, you know. Can I say on that that, you know, I think ultimately the chances of you prevailing on that through to the U.S. Supreme Court are very, very slim. Um, that Judge Brady, who's a decent guy, may well rule in, your, in favor, but it's very unlikely in the long term the Supreme Court will uphold something like that, which makes it very important that we pursue a strategy that involves an international approach to this. There's a lot of litigation going on in Europe right now about whether we as Europeans can deport people to the US because the American system, where solitary confinement is vastly more prevalent today than it was 30 years ago, that uh, whether we should be deporting people there, uh, just as we're now no longer allowed to deport people to face the death penalty. And it seems to me very important for us to be pursuing that strategy here in Europe as well. So let, let's make, I'm afraid we'll have to make this last question. Okay. Hello, my name is Um I feel that as a human, some of the worst things that you can have taken from you are your life, your freedom, and your liberty. Once you had that back, what were the most important things that you felt you wanted to do with the rest of your life, and what gave you enjoyment out of life as well? <clears throat> well, when I left Angola, thanks for the question. When I left Angola, I, I think I left with, with a commitment. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I said something that and uh, something like this, even though I was free of Angola, Angola would never be free of me. I'm, that mean I had made a commitment um, that whatever I could do to shed light on the circumstances which had dealt so down so dastardly with me, I would devote the rest of my, my, my time in focusing on, on this. I have no other alternative. Again, like I say, it would seem ludicrous for me to have you know, went through the stuff that I've been through. I, I could have pled guilty to 15 years if I just wanted to, 
you know, I could have just accepted that. I could have and got out uh, in seven years. I could have, you know, uh, only did 17 years. I ended up with 35 years, but I ended up doing 31 years if I was going to change my approach or change my mind. No, my mind was set to try to, you know, to focus on, 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 on an ill in society that needed, some, needed to be focused on. And so, you know, that, that was my, my quest. Once I got out, I wanted to make sure that I focused on the, on, on the system, the prison system, not just in Louisiana, um, but I saw, you know, Louisiana as just being a, the tip because there are people all, all across the nation who are considered uh, political prisoners who are in prison for the same reason in which I was, simply because they were framed, simply because they were uh, who they were. And so, you know, I, I made a commitment that I would devote the rest of my time, whatever time I have left, you know, to focusing on prison and, and to, to, yeah, to keep focus on uh, the case of injustice in the criminal injustice system. The, uh, I hope that's a long time, Robert. And let me, on behalf of everyone here, thank you very much, both for coming to England, learning about gin and tonic, and uh, sharing all of this stuff with, with people. So can I yeah, just you. ask everyone to... to thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. And 